All right, we are back now for PSET 4 solutions. So let's take a look at the first problem that we have here. It looks like we have some composite skis. Perhaps it is a transversely isotropic composite. So let's go ahead and open up our notebook and we can look at and use our special definitions, but let's go ahead and close that out. Let's open up a new book, a new notebook and start up fresh. And let's move it to the side here and let's start to kind of play around and uh, basically copy in those useful definitions. So I would highly recommend utilizing this um, to your benefit uh, <laughs> uh, and definitely do so. Uh, so we can kind of go ahead and take a peek, but actually we see here, uh, yes, let's go ahead and quit the kernel. I was playing, I was actually not playing, I was working diligently on problems previously, so let's go ahead and redefine here. And we can kind of start to pull out and actually create our transversely isotropic uh, compliance tensor. So that'll be very helpful for this problem. So let's go ahead and define this as S transverse. And we can see here that E3 is equal to E1. So let's go ahead and take a, let's zoom out a little bit and kind of define some values here. And we can go ahead and say, so if E3 is equal to E1, so we know that S33 should be S11, S22 is different because we have those different values there. So it looks like if, if E3 and E1 are equal to one another, we should anticipate that the fiber is basically placed in the two direction. And the fiber direction will be larger than the transverse directions as we've kind of defined previously. It's very helpful in these types of problems to just draw your coordinate system, draw the fibers, and then you can kind of see where your unique, you know, non-transversely isotropic planes exist. So here, because the fibers in the two direction, our one three plane is unique. So one three is a unique value. So that will differ from the other pairs of planes. So the non-fiber direction um, planes. So S12, you can define that is equal to S23. So everything else will be the same. So excellent. S44 is 23. S55 is 13. That is the unique. And then S12 again is the, you know, non-unique plane. So we should have five uh, independent components that we need to solve for, and we've got it right here. Excellent. We can also move a little bit further. Um, so we're given additional information in this problem. Because we know it's a transversely isotropic fiber composite material, the Young's modulus of my fiber is 197 gigapascals. The Young's modulus of my matrix is 0 0.25 gigapascals, so times 10 to the 9. And I know my, basically, my expressions for Fraction of the fiber. Let's go ahead and find some values here. So S11, so the transverse direction will simply be a fraction of the fiber over the Young's modulus of the fiber plus fraction of the matrix over Young's modulus of the matrix. Or, and we could redefine essentially right now fraction of the fiber. Fraction of fiber plus fraction of matrix must be equal to one, so we can just define that as F one uh, as fraction of my matrix is equal to one minus fraction of my fiber. My S two two will be one over fraction of my fiber times the fraction of my matrix plus, or excuse me, the Young's modulus of my fiber plus fraction of my matrix times the Young's modulus of my matrix. That is a mouthful to say. So we have S one and S two two now in terms of one variable here, and now we can go ahead and start to solve this problem. So let's go ahead. So sig OG, again, in our original coordinate system, um, 17, 3.5, 0, uh, 16, minus 10, 79, all that times 10 to the 6. And then we have our strain. Remember, be careful here. And again, this is where I regret having to copy, but it's just life. And I unfortunately can't do that here, but let's go ahead and see. Let's pull up the PDF where we may be able to copy this down. And I know this is laborious, but again, I'm very generous. I will do this for you all uh, just to make sure that you understand and to give you some hints and tricks on how you may anticipate actually going through and solving a problem like this. So 
copying, pasting, making sure it is the most um, it is the most accurate, essentially, or how you want to go through it the most um, efficiently. So that's very, very, very interesting. Very, very, very um, a good way to kind of go about doing this. Um, so we can go ahead and see here. Just copy and pasting. But here is the key part. So remember, we have to write it in engineering strain. So this is tensorial strain. When we're in Voigt notation, that one by six, I have to multiply those tensorial definitions by two. So that is very, very important. Make sure you do that, and vice versa. If I ask you for three by three, make sure that you kind of remember that as you go through problems in an exam. Um, so that's very, very, very critical. So um, we'll go ahead and make sure that this is indeed the case. So go ahead here, zero point, point three over five, there we go. So we've got our stress, we have our strain, now we can go ahead and start to solve. So we have everything that we need, so S transverse dot sig OG, we have our values that we need to solve for, and now I'm just going to solve strain OG, set E equal to S transverse dot sig OG, give us the values we need to solve for. I don't want negative values there for sure, so I've got all the rest. And so now we can simply pull those out and get the rest. That'll be my F, little f. F sub n is one minus FF. We've got that there. That's great. And then I can pull out my S12, set that equal my S13, set that equal my S44 set that one equal as well and my oops let's get times 10 and then my s55 and we've already defined s11 and s22 in terms of ff and we've got it everything is good it is nice in the world so i could do fraction of the fiber there's the fraction of my matrix um, and then we can look at it in matrix form. That would be my compliance tensor. So I know that that's part of the problem. So calculate stress strain compliance tensor. Um, so how would should the how should the fibers be oriented? Well, if I'm having a ski, I really want it to point it in basically in the three direction um, because again I want that stability to kind of stop myself as I'm racing down the slopes. So it should be in there. I don't see why it's in the two direction unless you're looking to kind of get some flex, um, basically. Uh, if you're trying to minimize, essentially flex the pole. But anyways, it's a problem I made up, so, and I don't do too much skiing. I'd rather do surfing, so uh, we don't have to worry about that. That's the great part about made up problems. Um, anyways, so calculate the stress strain, compliance, and stiffness tensors rotated 18 degrees clockwise around the two axes. Well, my, I could look at my new stress will be simply equal to T stress 2, so because it's the 2 axis, 2 dot my sig OG slash dot uh, theta goes to minus 18 degrees. So that would be my new stress. My new strain would be T, T strain 2, strain probably strain OG. We got that. And I could do my S prime is just going to be equal to T strain 2 dot uh, S transverse dot inverse of T stress 2 and then slash dot theta goes to minus 18 because of clockwise rotation. So that's my prime. If I just do inverse, I can get my compliance. Um, so I can look at a matrix form as well. Just to visualize. And I could do now inverse, exactly. Inverse of S prime. Get that out of there. So the matrix form. Just so that you all can see. Inverse S prime. Then matrix form. And then now we can do. So we've got all that good stuff. And yeah. Essentially that is what the problem is looking for. We could prove it, um, and actually we could prove it right now. If I do S prime dot new stress, we should be equal to this new strain. And what do you know? Match, 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 match. 
we are good to go. Now, let's go ahead into problem number two and start that uh, problem. All right, now on to problem two, as we said here. So let's go ahead, let's resize, quit our kernel, make everything disappear. And let's go ahead, but actually let's make a, a separation in our problem one. Let's minimize that. Let's define our useful definitions because they are very, very useful. Which professor, who, who created this? Oh yes, I did because I'm very generous to my students. For, <laughs> anyways. Uh, so I'm working with an orthotropic material. So let's look at our S ortho. And um, we're actually given these stresses and strains in this prime direction. We're told that S11 is equal to 18 times 10 to the minus uh, 15, or excuse me, 12 terapascals, excuse me. S12 is minus 15 times 10 to the minus 12. And our C33, which is gonna be S33 inverse one over. So one over 47.619 times 10 to the minus, times 10 to the nine, excuse me. And there's our S33. So there should be nine independent components originally. Now we can see that there's already six. So we should be able to solve for this, um, given that what we know here. Um, and you bet you we're going to have to kind of go through the rigmarole of uh, basically writing these down again. Um, so again, we're writing this, we're typing all this, um, and we are going to do this because, again, we want to kind of show you how you can actually calculate it quantitatively, which at times requires, um, which at times requires you to actually do all this work. So sometimes it's useful, hopefully this is very useful to see it rather than just uh, copy, jump, and shift enter. Um, and again, we want to kind of keep consistent essentially the form. So remember, when we get to strain in a second, that is engineering strain, strain not your shear tensorial definition of shear strain. Um, so we could do strain new, and you could write those values in as well. I'm just going to type it in this time because last time that wasn't super efficient. Um, and I think I could actually just type this quickly enough. Uh, to get this done. This is hard work, but we're willing to do it because we want to solve these very interesting problems. Um, so for the orthotropic materials, again, we're going to have to write out the full stiffness and compliance tensor for the, the original and the rotated coordinate systems and write out the stress and strain tensor for both, prove um, both ways. When I say prove both ways, it's essentially using that definition of strain prime is equal to S prime dot um, sig prime. So just so that we're all clear on what's expected on these types of problems. So S prime now is, again, I need to do uh, T strain one dot my S ortho dot inverse of T stress one. And then I need to do slash dot theta goes to here minus 28 because it's a clockwise rotation again. Minus 20 degrees. There we go. So we got S prime. We've got, it looks disgusting. Um, you could simplify it slightly, but I can now solve my new strain, or strain new, set it equal to S prime dot uh, sig nu, and got my values. That's it. Very nice, lovely problem. Um, again, it, it's really all about defining what is your material you're working with, and then um, seeing what are the knowns and unknowns um, but again, in this problem, it was really, really important, critical that you rotated this. So we are in the new coordinate system. We need to work with the S prime. That's very, very, very important. Um, so we don't know what that's, that tensor looks like in the kind of the new rotated coordinate system. So be aware of those. Make sure that you're uh, kind of seeing those values um, show up there. But excellent. So now we can look at this S prime. We've got it. So now I can look at that here, and now we can kind of get going with answering all the questions. Um, I can look at S ortho. We've got those values as well, fantastic. I could do the inverse if I wanted. Um, you can see some of the differences or some of the similarities as well um, across this tensor, but um, anyways. Uh, I could also look at now inverse S ortho, exactly. Get that matrix form. Um, so, you know, this would be our stiffness tensor. So, again, stiffness is just the inverse uh, of your compliance tensor. 
um, original, rotated, we've got all that good stuff. Now we need the stress and strains. Um, so now again, I am rotating back to my original coordinate system. So for my, for example, the inverse is prime as well. Just to look at it, just to be super, super diligent um, and to see these values here. Uh, diligent and thorough, really. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the stress and strain tensors as well. So I'm going to take my sig nu. I'm going to do sig old. So I'm going to do T stress one dot my sig nu, and I'm going to rotate back. So that was a counterclockwise, that was a clockwise rotation. I'm going to do counterclockwise. And I can see my values here. And then I can also do strain new or strain OG, T strain one, strain new, theta, that strain new. And now I should be able to confirm that by doing my S ortho dot sig OG. And then, great, they matched. Isn't, you know, who says that solid mechanics is very difficult and hard and super mathematical and just unpleasant? Not us. Um, excellent. So we got number two done. So now let's go ahead and move on to number three. I can maintain, say, the same notebook. I'm going to quit my kernel, clear everything, then reevaluate my super handy definitions. So we can go ahead and do that right here. And so I could also start to type out my sig OG. Luckily, this will be useful for several different problems, but I want to copy this just because there's a lot of, I may copy this. Uh, let's see if I can kind of see simultaneously, but it's, my eyes are unfortunately starting to uh, turn on me. But we could copy these because they're relatively straightforward. So let's copy that, paste it in. Again, I am making sure that we are all okay in terms of these values here. So I can go ahead and paste my 42, and then that's going to be the minus. Get rid of that value there in front, minus. Just gonna make sure. Let's just double check. It's not worth messing up the whole problem and a lot of our our work just to be a little bit faster. Solving problems efficiently is important, but solving them correctly is for sure more important. But we need both in this course. So negative here, and then we can get to our our values here. So we can copy all of those because there's no negative value there. Paste those in, just put a comma, and then we're done. Excellent. So that is our stress in the original coordinate system. Let's define also, actually, we can look at this here. And why not? So this is inverse terapascals as well. So we can say that S11, actually, let's go ahead and shift down on that. That'll be helpful. And this is going to be our S uh, cubic. So we only have three variable, three independent components. So S11 for chromium is 3.10 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, S12 is minus 0 0.46 times 10 to the minus 12. Oops, not five. Catch that exactly. Uh, and then finally, S44 is 10.10 times 10 to the minus 12. And there we go. So for the strains. This is just a nice, easy math problem. It's not even, you know, uh, I'm losing my fastball uh, in these days. <laughs> so it's just going to be s cubic dot sig og, and there's my strain. Now, you can leave it here. I, ideally, you would put it in the full strain tensor definition, but I'm probably going to be nice, and I'll give people credit for that. Um, all right, what is the stress and strain tensor for 46 clockwise rotation around the three axis? Prove you get the same answers multiple ways. So again, I could do... Um, t stress 3 dot sig OG, actually new stress, equals T stress 3 dot sig OG slash dot theta goes to minus 46. 46. I could do the same thing with uh, the strain that I get. So actually I could define, um, I could define that above as my strain. 
T strain three. Call this strain old, old strain. Old strain, new strain. There we go. I can do my S prime. So S prime equals T strain three dot. And now you should hopefully start to be comfortable with this type of um, math. Inverse T stress three slash dot theta goes to minus 46. Exactly. Copy that. My students taught me a new kind of shortcut key, but I'm still, I'm still old. <laughs> and voila, they match. Yay. All right. Now let's get into number five. Got that, got that. Great. So let's apply the same stress state now to a composite of S glass and epoxy. S glass is oriented along the one axis, right out the full stress and strain tensor. So again, I wanna clear everything um, and I'm going to want to exactly grab that original stress state. Let's do, this is number, well that was three and four. Now let's get into five. Let's do five here. G. Let's pull out the S transverse, although we're going to have to change some components of it, but it's always a good starting point. You could have these already defined for your exam. Um, that would be very, very helpful. I would strongly recommend it. So if they're oriented in the one axis, S11, S22, and S33 should be, uh, actually that's not S, and that should be S22, exactly. So if they're oriented on the one axis, one, uh, two is not unique. 2, 3 is the unique. Um, so we need S2, 3, S2, 3, and then we can change the rest of these. S1, 2, make all the S1, 3s be S1, 2. There you go. Um, S4, 4 is the 2, 3 direction. So um, again, that is the unique one. So S5, 5 must be that. And there we go. You can, um, actually, we'll go ahead and now start to look up um, S transverse. Now we can see it in the matrix form. Great. Now we need to look up our S glass and epoxy composite. So again, let's go ahead and look that up right here. So I'll zoom in. So for S glass in the one direction, um, our elastic moduli is 55 gigapascals, so we can we can start to define some variables. So S11 is going to equal to 1 over 55 times 10 to the 9. So let's go ahead and start to type in some of those variables. So we can go ahead and see and define again. Because E1, that that is the that is the Young's modulus of my fiber of my entire composite, not just the of the fiber itself. So we can now start to define that S11. And we can set that equal. Make that equal here. Just make it equal to the. Let's go ahead and see. There we go. Uh, let's look a little bit. One divided by 55 times 10 to the 9. My S22 will be. S22 is going to be equal to. S22. It's going to be equal to 1 divided by 16 times 10 to the 9. And you can use some of these other variables to solve some of the other, or at least reduce some of the other problems. But this is pretty, you can leave, again, you're not given the entire information of the problem to solve everything. So um, you can just now do uh, S transverse dot sig OG, and you can leave in terms of variables. So that's kind of the trick in this problem. Uh, you weren't given everything. Start to be comfortable with solving some of these problems in terms of just variables of itself. Um, and that is a completely valid way to solve this problem. So that would be sufficient in my eyes. Uh, you need some other variables. You can you can plug in some and actually get a little bit more quantitative. But that's what we're really looking for. Again, be comfortable with these compliance tensors. Set them up for the different materials. And then that is how essentially we want you to go about solving this problem. So um, yeah, we've got it effectively. So we, we need some other ones and then now, um, oh, uh, 
excellent little point here. A um, little bit of extra credit. How would you write out if there was basically uh, thermal expansion? Well, all we would do, especially if we were in the original coordinate system, is you'd have basically another one by six that would be one plus and a one by six alpha, whatever the alpha was in all the different directions, delta t, alpha delta t, alpha two delta t, alpha three delta t. So um, who knows, I may be tricky and on a potential exam, maybe I can give you that um, or maybe not. We'll see, am I nice or am I not nice? Um, I think I'll be nice, but it'd be nice a little problem, uh, maybe a little bit of an extra a side sub sub problem for your exam, especially since it's take home. And we are back and now let's take a peek at problem number six. Um, so let's rank the TG. So clearly from the chemical structure, three is greater than two is greater than one. Why the difference between one and two? They both look pretty flexible. All those very, very electronegative materials, even that methyl group is not gonna stand a chance. Um, so now we have to ask the question, which is polymers red, blue, um, and basically I'm looking at which is the storage modulus, which is the loss modulus, and we're looking as a function of strain rate. So at high strain rates, my material is gonna behave elastically. Um, at very, very low strain rates, long times, um, I am going to be looking at a viscous type response. So the higher symbol means the, uh, the more dominant feature. So at very, very low strain rates, it looks like the filled symbols are higher than the empty symbols, so I know that's the loss moduli. And the, or, and the storage moduli, G prime or E prime, that's gonna be the empty symbols too. So if I look at strain rate, high strain rate, looks at very low temperatures, um, and actually it's very high frequencies, excuse me. We'll make a note of that, or actually time. Um, exactly, let's, let's, let's change that one. So high strain rates, low temperature, um, Time is very, very short time at high strain rates. Uh, long times, obviously for um, as your strain rates decrease. Um, frequency is very high at high strain rates. Um, so we again, we wanna kind of know those equivalents. So at low frequencies, again, I'm behaving much more viscously. So viscous on the left, elastic on the right, we're good to go. So, Let's go ahead and let's take a peek uh, again in this kind of interesting looking graph. So we can kind of sh uh, show filled is our viscous response. So that is our G double prime, E double prime. Uh, our empty is our last response, G prime, E prime. And we can start to determine what is that crossover point. Um, Actually, we can see here, it's not quite right. Yeah, exactly. So let's do there, 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 and then black is kind of the furthest one. They're pretty close. So I'm looking at this almost similar to like our frequencies, our relaxation frequencies effectively. So our Deborah number, remember, is our relaxation time characteristic relaxation time over the experimental time. So way back into our Deborah lecture in lecture seven, we can see, go up a little bit more, and we find that Deborah number is our relaxation time, characteristic relaxation time of the polymer over the experimental time. And at very, very low Deborah numbers, we are viscous. At very, very high Deborah numbers, we are elastic in our response. Um, our material can't basically adjust if we have a very, very low relaxation time, we are good to go here. So our strain rate, so it's basically saying if yeah, our Deborah number is very, very low, then we're viscous elastic here. So rate is very similar to like a frequency. Um, so at very, very high strain rates, meaning very, very, very short times, that is my my transition here. So as I kind of go further and further here, it's it's giving me essentially an inverse value. So if I look at high strain rates, that is actually very, very uh, small times. So, because my time is inversely related to my frequency. So if my relaxation frequency is 100, it'd be one over 100. So 
if my relaxation time is very, very low, so my relaxation time of my black is less than my relaxation time of my blue, and then less than that of my red. So if my relaxation time is, my relaxation time, as that increases, my TG will increase as well. Um, so that's a very, very well established essentially phenomenon there. So if I look at that, my TG of, uh, so we got the blue, black, and the red shown right there. So blue, black, we've got it because of that inverse relationship there. Storage, draw the, qual the curve uh, qualitatively for polymer three. Polymer three has a very, very high TG. Um, so you can actually exaggerate even more so. Um, so the TG there would lead to a very, very, very um, low relaxation time. So you may even see that shift um, even more dramatic. Describe how you calculate relaxation times of the polymers when they behave viscous like solid. Like we kind of said, you have to kind of do this inverse. It's not really direct for a strain rate, but we're elastic there, we're viscous on this other side, and you do some type of like inverse or some calibration essentially factor um, that you would work with there. Reg the TG, we argue that to just to even start a problem like that. I think it's very good to kind of have that. All right, so here comes the problem many of you may most likely dread a little bit, um, but there's nothing to fear because we're gonna be okay. So we have a standard linear solid model. We need to break this into two components. Our first component is our old Kelvin void. Our second component is just a dash plot. So we need to find when these two components, one and two, are in series, we know that the stresses are the same and the strains have to add. So my strain of the SLS will be simply equal to the strain of my one arm plus the strain of my second arm, and that's it. And I could dot that too. Strain of my SL, stress of my SLS is equal to the strain of the one which is equal to the strain uh, stress felt in the two arm as well. So we're gonna leverage this. We want that constitutive equation where everything is only written in terms of SLS or E1, eta one, and eta two. That's it. That's what we have to kind of achieve here. Um, and so we could dot that as well because, why do we need to dot, dot that? Because we know our relationships is stress is equal to eta two, uh, basically epsilon dot. And for our spring, it's just our Hooke's uh, law as we usually kind of um, work with. So, how can we do this? How can we break this down? First, write out your expression for just the two arm. Um, it's much easier uh, because we already have that. Um, so we can go ahead and start that up. But we can also pull from the Kelvin void right now. So we need to see how is the strain or what is the expression for strain of my Kelvin void model? So that is my Maxwell. So here we go. We've got it right there. Strain of strain dot Kelvin Voigt is equal to stress of Kelvin Voigt. So we could actually, let's write this because unfortunately I can't copy the actual, I don't want to copy the whole page in. So I'm going to write it with my pen and I learned last semester finally with a handy technique I could actually just copy that over. So stress in KV over eta minus uh, my Young's modulus of my spring eta strain of KV. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to bring that over, and I'm going to um, basically solve the rest of these values right here as we get to it. Here's where we're going to zoom out a little bit. I'm just going to keep this keep this handy dandy thing on the side while I rewrite it kind of elsewhere. Um, so let's start to write. So my strain dot of SLS. So I can actually write down uh, kind of, so in my one arm, so I'm gonna replace Kelvin with just one, is equal to the stress of the one, which is equal to the stress of my SLS over eta one minus E one over eta one. Um, I'll need to make sure that is an eta one there in a second. And then this is the stress of my one arm. So again, not my SLS at this point. Um, so, there we go. And make sure that's an eta one there. Um, I'd love to make sure that's the case. Eta two is just gonna be simply equal to, and actually we can kind of go back and look at that arm. It's just gonna be, um, so we know that the stress, stress in our two arm is equal to eta two times epsilon prime um, of my two arm. So we can kind of rearrange those and essentially look through that um, in order to solve that answer. Actually, try and, uh, second here. 
a little bit of an issue. And we can kind of look back at those just to kind of remind ourselves of those two constitutive relationships. When we're using these kind of spring dash pot models, we have to model the spring relationship with this Hooke's law, and then our viscous term, which is just stress of our dash pot um, equals eta square root of our dash pot. So that will just be equal to this spring, SLS. So again, remember that is the key, um, eta two. That's eta one. There you go. So it's looking good. So SLS is equal to stress of SLS over eta one minus E one. Straight there, and we can get that. Plus stress of SLS. And actually, actually don't do the prime there. Um, stress of SLS. So that's over eight to two. And that is it. That is all she wrote for this particular problem. So we are all good to go here. There's nothing else that needs to be, oh, oh our horrible friend epsilon one. We need everything in SLS. So what are we gonna do here? How can we remedy this? So what we have to do is we have to actually go back to our original definition, um, which was epsilon one, we could rewrite that equation there as strain of SLS. If we do strain dot, strain dot of SLS minus E2 prime, minus epsilon two dot. Ah, there's always one fly in the ointment that screws it up for everything else. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, a time has come for us uh, in here. So I need to do that. Um, now to dot this, we'll have to dot everything in that expression. So let's zoom out here. So in order to incorporate that in, in order to solve it, I'm gonna have to double dot now SLS equals stress dot SLS over eta one minus E one over eta one times strain dot SLS, strain dot SLS minus stress of SLS over eta two plus stress SLS over eta two. Uh, stress dot, because again, we had to actually dot everything there. Whew, wasn't that a mess? But it all worked out in the end, so. All right, that is fantastic. So that's the constitutive equation. That is the major points in this problem. Um, and we'll get back to that in a second. But um, so let's go ahead. Uh, what's the constitutive equation? What is the effective stiffness at short times and long times? And what would be the stress relaxation values um, at short and long times? Um, so when we look at very, very short times, we can replace, um, at very, very short times, we can replace our dash plot with a, just a solid line. And we can replace at long times, infinite times, we can really place that dash plot as empty. So at time equals zero, that's just a straight line. So if that's the case, I'm pulling and then I have an infinite because right, like my I can't effectively pull on that, you know, it's it's trapped uh, in that Kelvin Voigt model because we're in parallel. At infinite times it's just removed. So at infinite times my stress would be basically zero um, for this, you know, um, types of problems. All right, so the last problem, oof, uh, we, can, uh, we need to kind of look at these graphs and determine what type of test was done. So constant stress was given and we're measuring essentially strain. So what type, and actually we can see that 1.5 times 10 to the eighth Pascals. What type of experiment is that? I have constant stress. Constant stress, creep. So remember, creep, is constant stress. Stress relaxation is constant strain. So I relax the stress. I should see the stress decrease. So I'm, I'm looking at the stress there. So I'm applying constant strain. Creep is I'm applying constant stress. And then I'm looking at the strain value there. So that's a very, very important um, type of hate behavior that we should essentially expect to see there. So ensure that that is essentially the case that you're working with. Um, and then we can kind of work through uh, and work with work with that effectively.
Excellent. So let's go through and we can kind of see what we're looking at here. Uh, and again, so we're looking at creep and then we have in our model here, it looks pretty linear. So, ah, this looks familiar. So for our creep expression for our Maxwell model, we found that expression. I'm gonna actually write it out again so I can copy it in there. So let's go ahead and take a peek at that and we'll be able to copy it in. So let's go ahead and let's copy that. Then we can kind of go ahead and essentially see what we're looking at here. Excellent. So we have this. So we have our initial, oops, let's go ahead and I'm going to basically look at this. And then find effectively here. So that's my sig naught. Our epsilon naught, we are told the y-intercept is 0.15. Excellent. Great. And we could actually now use that to, and let's write our function. So our e fun, let's see. Let's take a minute here. Let's define those. I don't know what my eta is, but I know certain values of strain as a function of time. So perhaps I could use that to solve. Um, I can look at my y also. So if I just look at sigma naught over e naught instantaneously, I'm just going to look at my Young's modulus there. Um, so that seems valid as well. And we can go ahead and now start to write out that function. Because again, when you're just initially, if you're in a, if you're in a Maxwell model, you're just pulling on that, you know, um, that, you know, that value there. And actually, you could kind of think about it if it's just a straight line initially uh, at very very small times. It's just my Young's modulus that I'm pulling on. So um, let's say at 10 seconds, I'm 1.5 times 10 to the minus seven. Uh, let's see, e naught plus sig naught divided by eta. Then let's multiply all that times 10, yeah, times t. Function, there's my function. Let's go ahead and solve. There, so let's go ahead, let's pull it over here. So my strain, let's go ahead and solve. 1.5 times 10 to the seven. Actually, let's solve when my function, actually, function slash dot, t goes to, actually, yeah, function slash dot t goes to 10. And then that whole thing will be equal to 1.5 times 10 to 7. Solve that. I can just basically sift in there. But, or I can kind of give it in terms of eta. So let's go ahead and let's move this just around here. Eta is 100, and that is Pascal seconds. All right. So that's my eta. My relaxation time should be eta over my Young's modulus, eta my y. So that's my relaxation time. Great. So let's go ahead and let's go back and actually answer what that question was asking us to do. So we've got it. So let's go back to piece at four. All right, Young's modulus, got it. Viscosity, got it. Type of test, creep. Relaxation time, got it. Model, Maxwell. We got it. We're done. P set four is in the books. Yes. And have a happy Halloween.